generative AI is here and it has changed the rules of the game. Experts like Seth Godin and Robert McKee have been very clear. The authors who are going to make it in this business are those who are writing truly amazing, knock your socks off innovative stories. The bar is that high. AI will replace mediocre writers. But at some point, everybody is mediocre. So what do you do? You educate yourself. And the good news is that there's still time, but you've got to start leveling up right away. I'm Valerie Francis, and I've got a series of webinars to help you do just that. My specialty is helping authors like you put theory into practice. Understanding the tools of our trade and being able to apply them with precision is no longer an option. It's an absolute necessity. So go to valeriefrancis.ca slash webinars for more information and sign up for the notifications. You can't afford not to. If you want to write stories your readers will love, there are three things you need to do. Understand storytelling principles, see how other writers have applied those principles, and then use them in your own work. Here on the Story Nerd Podcast, our goal is to demystify story theory. We'll help you with the first two steps so that you can get started with the third. My name is Valerie Francis. I'm a writer and literary editor, and I focus on stories by, for, and about women. And I'm Melanie Hill, writer, editor, and poet, and I have a passion for spy stories, fairy tales, and master detective novels. On today's episode, Melanie pitched The Lost Daughter so that we can study conflict. This 2021 film was directed by Maggie Gyllenhaal from a screenplay by Maggie Gyllenhaal, and it's based on the book by Elena Ferrante. Now, of course, there will be spoilers. <laughs> it's not that it's going to help you this week because we can't talk about the movie without talking about the movie. <laughs> and please help other writers find our show by leaving a rating and review. For Apple Podcast listeners, you can do it right from your phone. Just go to the show's landing page, scroll to the bottom, click five stars. <laughs> it's that simple. Okay, Melanie, The Lost Daughter, what what inspired you to recommend this one this week? <laughs> <laughs> well, because I've wanted to see it for a long time. Um, and I thought, well, this would, it, it struck me, I haven't seen it before we watched it this season, but it struck me as something that would be very internally driven in terms of the characters. And so I really wanted to focus this week on internal conflict and, and potentially see how it's externalised Um yeah, so that's why. And I and I think I really wanted to love it and really wanted to, it to be a, uh, a good movie. And I think the content and the topic that it addresses is a really important one. <laughs> and I'm trying to be, this week I'm going to be as positive as I can about this movie. <laughs> so I suppose listeners will note that... Um, Yes, it, it probably has got a few issues that uh, that we'll dive into as we go along. But just quickly before I talk about conflict in the movie, what <laughs> what did you think of it and what were your first impressions? Ha <laughs> ha. Okay. I really wanted it to be amazing. I wanted it just to be blown away. And I was bored out of my mind. <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> I thought only for you, Melanie, would I watch this movie to the end. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I think this is a really good example of a story that doesn't translate well to a screen. Mm -hmm. yes. I haven't read the book. Maybe the book is brilliant. I suspect if we read the book, we would we would have a lot more empathy for Lita, the main character. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we'd understand more what's happening. It would mu be much more yeah. engaging. I don't mm -hmm. think it's a great story to adapt to the screen or rather that the adaptation, even though it won awards, is not as good as, say, something like The Wife, which mm -hmm. is a brilliant adaptation. And the yeah. other thing before we get going that I just want to mention to listeners, Melanie is on the road today. Uh, oh, so yes. this is how dedicated she is to the podcast. <laughs> she is on the road. So if the audio is a little different than usual, that's why. Okay, here we go. All right. The, <laughs> the internal and external conflict in The Lost Daughter, I think, is very tightly woven. In fact, it's so close that it 
could be used as an example and a good example of how the internal becomes externalized. But in a very micro fashion, I'll just add that in there to qualify that a little bit more. Now, we saw this in Ladybird last week, but this week in The Lost Daughter, it is far more specific and very focused. Now, the title of this movie is The Lost Daughter, and I believe that each of the women that feature in it were lost daughters to some degree. But the one that we're most interested in is Lita. And at various stages, we see her as a newly married mother, an academic on the verge of a career breakthrough, and as a solo middle-aged professor on holiday. But before I go even deeper, um, I believe there is a key story element missing from the movie this week. So we learn about Lita's story via flashback, but the part that's missing is actually Lita's time with her mother when she was younger and when Lita was perhaps the lost daughter. So there is only one small reference to Lita's mother in the movie and that's what piqued my interest about this and it's when Lita tells Joe that she's leaving him and the girls and he says that he'll take them to her mother's. Now Lita protests at that point but it's not enough to stop her leaving but it was enough for me to become curious as to why she had that reaction. So I did some research and in the book, which the movie is based on, um, apparently it covers Lita's relationship with her mother and her childhood. And from what I read, this background could have helped us understand Lita a lot better. So one of the topics the book presents is about the line of intergenerational psychological damage that's done by mothers to their daughters. But this obviously doesn't come out in the movie, but I was very curious about that and about how the book is different to the movie and at some stage I might double down and actually try and read the book and it's a translated book but um, it's a novella as well so it should be relatively easier to read. Now the other part of Lita's story that's missing or not clear is when Lita decided to return to her daughters after three years away from them. So she worries throughout the movie or the subtext is that she worries that her absence has had an impact on the relationship she has with them. But there's actually, I think Valerie and I both discuss at some stage that there's a lot of things that aren't very clear about Lita's decision making or things that Lita does. And it it actually ends up being a bit confusing throughout the movie. Now, if we had some of this additional information, I think the movie would make more sense, to be quite frank. <laughs> you know, we we see the movie starting with Lita's arrival in the in the Greek holiday village, and it's unclear as to why she's there. I think I don't really buy some of the things that she's saying. So there's a lot of things going on in the movie where you don't get a sense that Lita's really either telling the truth or she's not telling herself the truth. And I think that sets up a lot of Lita's inner turmoil. Lita's inner turmoil spills into the physical world when the family from Queens arrives at the beach at the same resort where she is. And in one of the interactions, Lita tells a pregnant Callie, but she also tells herself, I think, um, that she believes that children are a crushing responsibility. And when Lita said that to Callie, That's when I started to understand what Lita's conflict was or her internal conflict was. And I also understood what Lita meant later on in the film when she tells Nina or confesses to Nina and she says that she is an unnatural mother. So I think these two lines really make it clear that Lita's inner conflict or her conflict in her life, it's about the guilt and also the non-guilt, which is centred around the unfulfilling roles of marriage and motherhood that are thrust onto women who have to give up their sense of self after forging a career that they love. All right, so some of the things when I think about leaders' internal conflict came out for me 
and when I got that sense, as I mentioned before, that things weren't right or things were a bit weird for her, you know, there's a few points in the movie when there's when I knew that something was going on with Lita. And that first instance, I think, was when um, she meets Lyle. Her, you know, that signals that her interactions with people are awkward and particularly while she's on this holiday. You know, we then move into some of the backstory with her children and her husband and you kind of very much get the sense that she's not very happy at times being a mother and trying to work and manage a relationship. Now, there's also scenes of incredible tenderness in the flashbacks and moments of intense attention with her daughter. And there are also then the fraught scenes with Bianca where Lita withholds care, she withholds affection, you know, she strikes Bianca, she says terrible hurtful things to her young daughter. And then there's also at the conference when Lita goes to the conference and she receives the praise of for her work and then there's also the freedom that Lita experiences that um, inspires her her decision to leave the girls and Joe when she's at that conference. We see that the decisions that Lita made during her flashbacks still impact her behaviour while she's on holiday nearly 20 years after she leaves her daughters. And at the time of the movie, her daughters are adults and they are visiting their father while Lita's on vacation. And then we switch to Lita's empathy or obsession, fascination for, for Nina and her daughter, Alana. And I believe that this starts to represent Lita's internal conflict and puts it on the screen. And it also partially maybe explains some of Lita's unexplainable um, uh unfathomable <laughs> actions in stealing Elena's doll and keeping it, especially when she knows that it's causing Alana and Nina a lot of distress. Now, using the analysis questions that I've used all season, here's how I've broken down Lita's internal conflict. So the first question is, what does Lita need? Well, the answer to this question I think is revealed in the last scene when Lita speaks to Bianca and Marta, her daughters, on the phone. And they are both really happy to hear from her. So Lita needs to let go of the guilt that she feels around motherhood. Um, hey, Melanie, can I jump in here for a minute? Yeah, sure. I have a very different take on Lita's objects of desire. So objects of desire are what a character wants and needs in a story, okay? Okay. I'm not, you know this, I know, Melanie. Yeah. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just explaining it again to refresh people's memory. Okay, so the objects of desire are what a character wants and needs in a story. The want is tied to the plot. It's what the plot's all about, actually. It's the, what the character is going after. The need is tied to the character herself and her development. It's her arc right? One way of thinking about it is this. Who is it that the character needs to become in order to achieve her goal or to obtain her want or even to fulfill their potential and have even just the hope for a better future, depending on the type of story that you're writing? Because this is a mini plot story, Lita is a passive protagonist. She doesn't really have a want in the way that we're used to seeing a want because we're used to seeing arc plot stories. That's what, you know, 99% of the stories are. It's what we think of when we think of a story. In a mini plot story, when you have a passive protagonist, there is nothing that she is actively pursuing. Now, yes, she does want Elena's doll but she takes it and she keeps it. So <laughs> that doesn't work as an object of desire for a story. As far as I can figure, the only thing that Lita really wants is attention. This is why she does what she does. And she gets it from pretty much everyone except Bianca. Yes, she and Bianca do talk on the phone, but Bianca tends to end the conversation abruptly. It's limited attention. 
And it's attention via a distance because they're on the phone. And what does um, Lita say earlier in the movie? She hates talking to her children on the phone and they hate talking to her on the phone. And yet right now in present day, that seems to be the only connection that they have. Now, in the flashbacks, it's Bianca as a little girl who wants Lita's attention, and she does receive it, but in limited amounts, right? So this is like a, a cats in the cradle kind of thing. Now, all indications are that this attention from Bianca will continue to be limited because Lita never gets what she needs. What I think she needs is to grow up, frankly. <laughs> so she wants attention specifically from her daughters, but she's never going to have it as long as she continues to be selfish. And unfortunately, Lita remains selfish to the bitter end. Now, I know I'm coming out of left field with all these comments, and they're not necessarily jibing with what you've said, Melanie, but hopefully when I get to my part, my comments now will make a lot more sense. You'll understand why I'm making them. Anyway, I just wanted to pop in there because because it's such a weird story and, and objects of desire are so important that I just wanted to highlight that it can take some time to think about a movie or a story and figure out what the wants and needs are, especially in a, a, a character-driven story. Anyway, that's all for me. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I really disagree with, uh, with what you've said. So, uh, you know, and that's okay, right? We're coming at it and we're interpreting it very differently. Um, so I don't see Lita as selfish at all. And I think it's, um, it's Marta that she's talking to on the phone in the first phone call. And it's not until she gets to the end that she talks to Bianca at all. And they're, I think in Canada while she's in Greece. But anyway, it's that aside. And, you know, this is the beauty of storytelling and the differences that we see in in stories. And I have a lot more empathy, I think, for Lita than maybe the average person would, <laughs> because I really do see her struggling with um, the her role as a mother, especially as a young mother. And I really do see that that has trickled through for the rest of her, for the rest of her life and has put her in this predicament of where she has this weird interaction with the the family from Queens. Um, but anyway, so what's at stake for Lita? Well, I think Lita's inner peace is at stake and um, it's also the continuance of her relationship with her daughters. So what then are the forces of antagonism? So Nina and Elena, I think, are the forces of her antagonism. And also there's a level of self-judgment that comes with being a young mother and potentially having left your daughters or left your children at some stage of their early development. Now, one, mis one of the mistakes that writers can make when telling an internal story or a what we call sometimes a character-driven story is that they overlook the external conflict. And it's the external conflict that still must drive the story forward because the external conflict must trigger the internal conflict, right? So the lost daughter does this, and there are very key points in the story, I think, where the internal becomes externalised. And while we know that something is up with Lita when she arrives on her holiday, it's the arrival of the family that then triggers Lita's internal conflict or we start to see that become externalised. And the family and Nina force Lita to act in some way, even if we don't necessarily understand why it is, they do force her to act and react to them on the beach. All right then, so what are the keys that I've seen or the key things that I've seen in terms of external conflict? Well, we see the family on the beach and the way they arrive. They come in and they're very noisy in what was quite a serene and peaceful place. And I think that from Lita's point of view, she sees them as quite menacing and, she, and we see that very closely in terms of the way they look at her or the way that we see the, her interpreting their um, gazes at her 
you know, we also get a vague description from Will and Lyle that hint and they state that, you know, they're a bad family. And the family creates tension in the story because they speak violently and threaten physical violence, especially towards Lita and those around them. And in the end, it is Nina that lashes out at Lita and hurts her. So I've broken down the external conflict for Lita this way. So what does Lita want? Well, I think to start with, she wants quiet time on the beach and a peaceful holiday. And what's getting in her way? Well, the large family from Queens. And what's at stake for Lita? Well, the quality of Lita's holiday, but that's not all. The stakes of the external conflict are linked to the internal conflict. And here is where the story is tightly woven. And I think this is a clever way to focus a story, even if in this movie the execution is not as neat. Lita's fascination with Nina is where the internal and the external conflict meet. The story doesn't offer any answers but instead I think it's an exploration of motherhood as a burden of responsibility and loneliness. Now, although I've identified some possibilities for the conflict in this movie, I don't believe that the conflict in The Lost Daughter is entirely clear, especially the internal conflict. This originates, or my thoughts on this originate from a few things, including when Lita's backstory is revealed and it's a very incomplete backstory, and also the links between Lita's past and the empathy she feels with Nina in the present. So the movie also touches lightly on the general violence and hostility towards middle-aged women who stand up for themselves. So there's the beach scene when Lita is asked to move and make way for the Queen's family. And there's also the scene in the cinema where she asks for the disruptive group to leave and then she's verbally abused. Now, there's some other really interesting things in this story that I that if you wanted to see a good example of how to create an unreliable narrator, I think you could actually say that Lita is very unreliable in terms of how she remembers things or what she her point of view in this movie. So she is very awkward and she has a lot of unexpected mannerisms and her behaviour around normal people is quite confusing. And we see examples of that with Will and Lyle. And she also has fantasies and she also there are and there are also tricks of memories or memories play tricks on her. And I think what Maggie Gyllenhaal is trying to do is create a hyper subjective point of view which I thought was an extremely difficult thing to do in a movie. But I do think that she does achieve this reasonably well by keeping the camera tightly on Lita and focusing on what Lita sees. Now, before I hand over to Valerie to talk about cast design, the most wonderful thing about this movie is that Maggie Gyllenhaal doesn't judge Lita. Lita is portrayed equally as a loving, curious and caring mother as much as she becomes resentful, angry and is overwhelmed. And when I watched Lita leave her daughters and husband, I felt it was one half self-preservation and the other part self-absorption. So I truly understood why Lita made the decision and I didn't judge her either in this movie. And I think the topic that it's trying to address is one that we should try to examine more in movies. And that's so that's why I'm trying to be positive about a movie that has, I think, many flaws and doesn't quite execute as well as others. But I do think that it has some really interesting things to say. And I, and I love the way that it didn't necessarily judge Lita a great deal. All right, Valerie, I get the feeling that we're not going to talk much about cast design and maybe a bit more about the mini plot sort of character driven stories is that where is that what you're going to focus on this week that is what I thought I was going to focus on this week because when I first watched the movie and I've watched it I think four times (laughs) I, I thought I wasn't going to get through it once but I actually watched it multiple times because I was afraid I was dismissing it too quickly and I also really 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 wanted it 
to be good. And I was hoping it would get better the more times I watched it. It did not. <laughs> um, but I, the more I dug into Lita's character and the more I looked at the design of the cast, uh, the more I ended up focusing on that. It is a mini plot, 100%. And if you don't know what I mean by mini plot, go back to the episode that we did on The Accidental Tourist. I think it's season five. Um, and I talk about all the, um, the aspects, the features of a mini plot. One of them is, as I said, a passive protagonist. All right. Cast design. Honestly, Melanie, part of me wonders if we watch the same movie. But anyway, okay, let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, cast design. All right, let's start by reminding you again what the theory is here. It's not difficult theory to understand, but it can be difficult to apply because in order to design the cast of your story, the cast of supporting characters, you need to first have a really solid understanding of who your protagonist is. And the hard truth is that most writers do not know their main characters well enough. And that generates all kinds of problems. Now, there's a lot of character sheets floating around out there. I'm sure you've seen them. And they tend to focus on things like the character's physical appearance or the favorite TV shows or their marital status or who their best friend is and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, you might need to know those things. But that doesn't tell you who the character is. Robert McKee makes a distinction between characterization, which is all that superficial stuff, and true character. And it's only when I heard him talk about character in this way that I really started to understand how to create characters that are interesting and that are interesting enough to, to hold a reader's attention for 350 pages. It could take them a month or more to read the book. So you have to have a character that can sustain long form storytelling over a long period of time. It's not an easy thing to do. So characters that work, that leap off the page, that come to life for us, like I said, that, that sustain a reader's attention are characters that have dimension. In other words, they have conflicting traits. And those traits are exposed via the character's actions and interactions with the supporting cast. Quite often, the character is not even aware of the contradictions within themselves. But you and I, as the authors, we need to be aware of what these contradictions are. So once you know who your character is and what their conflicting traits are, only then can you design your cast. And again, I talked about this in the ep in um, episode one of the season, which uh, is the episode we did in August, Osage County. I did a big explanation of all this theory, so you can go back and listen to that episode. One of the things I mentioned is Robert McKee's idea of a cast map. Now, I'm a visual learner, so I love this cast map idea. What he does is look at a cast as though it's a solar system. The protagonist is the sun, and the major characters are like planets orbiting the sun. The minor characters are like moons circling the planets. Alrighty, so who is Leda Caruso, and how do we know that? The best phrase that I can think of to describe Leda is arrested development. <laughs> Sure, there's a whole argument to be made for social conditioning and generational trauma, and those are usually great things to create empathy. I don't think they work very well here, though, in this particular presentation. And Melanie, you already alluded to this. One of the reasons I think it's not working here in this particular form is, again, because it's a mini plot story. It's like the accidental tourist, um, and therefore Lita is a passive protagonist. And in fact, uh, uh, there's an argument to be made for her, and I'm going to make it in a minute, for being passive aggressive. Now, social conditioning, in my opinion, was used to much greater effect in The Wife, which we studied in season six. And generational trauma, I think, was used to much greater effect in episode one of the season, August Osage County. Here in The Lost Daughter, because Leda is a passive protagonist, she comes off like someone who 
has just bought into this whole victimhood mentality mentality. And I've had it with that. I mean, honest to God, Harry and Meghan have pushed me over the edge with that. I cannot take it anymore. <laughs> it's like chewing tin foil for me now. <laughs> oh, so now <laughs> I, I don't know what it's like in the novel. It might be totally different. The novel might be, you know, amaze balls. I have no idea. I'm focusing only on the film because that's the only thing I've seen. If we had seen Lita trying to overcome her trauma and failing, I would have had tremendous empathy. Or if we had seen her trying to do right by her children, even after realizing that she didn't really want children, I would have empathized. When we have empathy with the character, it means that we recognize something in the character that is like ourselves. And Melanie, my eyebrows raised. You couldn't see me, but my eyebrows raised when you said you had empathy for her because I don't have any, like not even, a, not even a drop. I tried, but it's like blood out of a turnip. There just isn't any. Now, empathy is not sympathy. In other words, the protagonist, your protagonist, my protagonist, it doesn't have to be a likable character. And Lita's not likable. That is okay. I think she's selfish and she abandons her daughters. I mean, that is difficult to put in the likability column. But if we had seen her striving to be more, to striving to be a better mother, striving to, be, to do right by her children, and then leaving the children because maybe that is the best thing that she can do for them. Something like that. Wow. Now that would have had a huge, huge uh, emotional impact. But the way the movie is presented, we don't see any of that. And we don't see any remorse from her. I think that's unfortunate. I really do. I think that was a missed opportunity. In the scene where Leda is telling Nina that she abandoned her children for three years, Leda begins to cry. For a nanosecond, I thought this might be remorse. But we very quickly realize that, Nita is, uh, that Leda isn't crying because she regrets having left her kids. She's crying because she loved not being around her children. And intellectually, she knows that as a mother, she should not be feeling that way. That's not what natural mothers feel. And she calls herself an unnatural mother, right? Natural and unnatural in quotation marks. What's worse, the reason she went back to her children is because she missed them and she wanted to ease her own feelings of longing. She did not think about how much her children had missed her in those intervening three years or what kind of trauma she would cause her own children by suddenly re-entering their lives. And the reason we don't see Lita doing anything about this is again, because she's a passive protagonist, which is part of the mini plot story. It's really hard to pull off a passive protagonist. Just, I'm just saying it really is. So if you're, if you're thinking of writing a pure mini plot story, watch The Accidental Tourist, watch this movie, and just see how you're feeling about these passive protagonists. I don't find it very satisfying at all, but mini plot is one of the forms of storytelling that is open to you, and you can use it if you want. Over and over again, we see Leda putting herself first. She put her own needs ahead of her children's. And she even puts her own need ahead of Elena, who's the little girl in present day uh, at the resort, who's maybe about five. She puts her need ahead of Elena's by stealing Elena's doll and keeping it. For the whole movie, she keeps it. Even when she knows that Elena can't sleep without her doll and she's crying all the time and she's... she's um, you know, I was going to say traumatized, but the word trauma gets tossed around so much. It's, it's starting to get watered down. And I think that's not fair. So the little girl is very, very upset by not having her, her doll. Even when Lita knows that she refuses to return it. She even throws the doll in the garbage rather than returning it to the little girl. Come on now. 
mean, that's pretty selfish. Yes, in the end of the movie, she does return the doll uh, to Nina, who's Elena's mother, but it's not because she's had a change of heart and is now going to do the selfless thing. She returns it because she's done with it. She's leaving the resort and going home. So now she is returning the doll to Nina. All right, so that's Lita being selfish. And to drive home just how selfish and how childish she is, Lita is putting her own needs ahead of not just adults, but of three little girls, her own two and Elena. This is why I've used the term arrested development. Lita acts like a child. She hasn't matured. She doesn't take on responsibility. She wants the doll to replace her own doll, Mina, that she threw out the window. Now, Lita also throws temper tantrums. And yes, I'm saying temper tantrums. I do not think these are justified bursts of frustration or emotion. One example is that she took her doll because her daughter, Bianca, was playing with her doll. She snatched it away from Bianca and threw it out the window. Now, that's the sort of stuff that preschoolers get on with. That is not the way a mature adult responds to a child who I think is seven. It's just not how a, an adult does it. Another example is uh, those guys in the theater. And Melanie, you and I keep picking up on the same couple of examples, but we're reading them totally differently, which is interesting. Lita doesn't handle that, that situation in the theater the way a mature adult would either. What she does is threaten to tell on them. This is what kids do. If you don't be nice, I'm telling mom, or I'm telling the teacher, or I'm telling whoever, that's what she does. She threatens to tell the usher, and then she threatens to call the police. And in the end, she stomps out of the theater like a petulant child. That is that is her action. To me, her action is over the top. It is not a justified uh, outburst. It is not a mature outburst. Yes, the guys are being arseholes. <laughs> That's, you can't deny that. But I think also Lita is acting petulant. Now, I said that Lita's passive aggressive, and there's two examples of this, in my opinion. The first is in the scene when Callie asks her to move to an umbrella further down the beach. Lita refuses, but eventually does accept a piece of birthday cake that Callie offers. And she accepts it with the comment, children are a crushing responsibility. Happy birthday. <laughs> that whole scene is passive aggressive behavior from Lita. The second example is when Lyle comes over with um, the octopus. Lita leaves the doll on the patio table for him to see and comment on. She's trying to bait him. She's trying to get a rise out of him. And this is also what little kids do. Years ago, I lived uh, next door to a little girl who used to do exactly this kind of thing. She used to hover a foot over my flower bed and say, Valerie, I'm going to crush your flowers. She was just trying to see my reaction. Or she'd hold a rock next to my car and say, Valerie, I'm going to scratch your car. Baiting me just exactly the way Lita tried to bait Lyle and he didn't take the bait. Now that little girl was maybe five years old at the time and she eventually grew out of it. Lita is 48 years old and she is doing the same thing by leaving the doll out on the table. She's kind of saying, Lyle, I'm the one who took Elena's doll. What are you going to do about it? He does nothing. He does not take the bait. Now, we know that Lita is a liar. She lies constantly. Too many examples for me to even list. She's also a manipulator. She asks Will to supper just so that she can get information about Nina and her family. That's all we see. The whole conversation between Lita and Will at supper is her getting information about them. Now, the joke is on her, though, because Will and Nina are manipulating her right back. They want the keys to her apartment so that they can have their tryst there. So in terms of character dimension, I can really only see one. And that is that publicly, Lita is a well-respected professor, which, you know, by definition, assumes a certain level of maturity, or we can infer that the world regards her in a particular way. And actually, we did see 
in one of the flashbacks that her peers, like the, the guy with the beard that she has an affair with, he does regard her very highly. And the older academic also values her opinion because he comes to her for input on her, on his speech. So publicly, she is a respected uh, professor. Privately, she's still very much a child. Now, I really do want to say that Lita loves her children, yet also resents them. But there isn't enough evidence here for me to say that she loves them. I don't think she hates them. I do not think she hates them. I think she resents them. I think she tolerates them. And I think she might even say that she loves them, like in that scene where she's on the phone with them and she's telling them, you know, I love you, I, I miss you, I'll see you when I get home, that conversation. But the second she hangs up the phone, she says, I hate talking to my kids on the phone. So her words might say, yes, I love my kids, but her behavior doesn't back that up. And it's a character's actions that reveal who they are, not their words. All right, so in terms of cast design, if we look at the, the flashback sections, the orbit around Lita are her husband, her children, and the two academics, the old guy and the, that bearded tool guy. Her children bring out her childishness. The older academic is merely a statement of uh, the patriarchy in her workplace, I think, uh, you know, because she's doing the work and he's getting the credit. That bearded tool, oh, he just was, I, I know so many guys like him, he just got on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he brings out her selfishness, right? Because with him, she indulges herself. It's another example of how she's putting herself ahead of her family. She even tells him, like I said, that she doesn't like to talk to her children on the phone. And that is, again, an example of passive aggressive behavior. And she makes that statement to get a reaction from him. She even repeats it. Her husband is kind of like a foil. Now, it's clear that he isn't finding parenthood any easier than she is. There are parallel scenes with each of them um, on the phone talking about work, and they're both trying to shoo the kids away. And when the hikers arrive, the husband laments that he no longer has the freedom to do those kinds of things. So Lita and her husband are alike in those ways. Where the husband becomes a foil is is in the, the area of maturity because he stays with their daughters. Lita abandons them. He stays. So he puts the girl's needs ahead of his own and Lita put her needs ahead of the girl's. So all of these characters in the flashback scenes, um, they're in orbit around Leda. And I think as a terms of a cast design, I think they're working pretty well. Where I think the cast design falls apart are the present day Lita scenes, the ones with Olivia Coleman. And I think the reason that the present day parts of the movie hold our attention as well as they do is because it's Olivia Coleman, who's amazing. It's really hard to look away from the screen when she's doing her thing. She is that good. In episode one this season, the August Osage County episode, um, I talked about something that Stephen Pressfield taught me, and it's this. The cast needs to be as small and as interconnected as possible. Now, there are very good reasons for this, but it would take me <laughs> several hours to explain it. For now, suffice it to say that if the characters are not interconnected, when conflict arises, as it must in every scene, the relationships between these characters will break down immediately. Now, in episode four this season, the it's on the movie No Way Out, Melanie talked about triangular relationships. So if you haven't heard that episode, you really do want to go back and listen to it. It's, it's a really amazing piece of theory that will solve a lot of your problems. Trust me. <laughs> there has to be a reason for the major characters to stay in orbit around the protagonist. For example... In August Osage County, they're family. They are always going to be family. And we, as the audience, know that even though at the end of that movie, everyone has gone their separate ways, 
they will come back together again. Violet is going to die sooner or later. And when that happens, they will reconvene for her funeral, just like they have come together for Beverly's funeral. Now, think about this as it relates to present day Leda. None of those people at the resort have a connection to Leda. Yes, they're all staying at the same resort, but they don't need to talk to her. There is nothing binding these people together. And when they do come together, it's by happenstance. And it's over and over again, right? Leda just happens to be sitting in that chair when Callie and her family arrive on the beach. Leda just happens to be at the beach when Elena goes missing. She happens to be in the theater when those boys who are part of Callie's family, when they come in. Um, Leda happens to be in the toy store when Callie and Nina come in. Coincidence is not enough. So in my opinion, in present day, um, the cast is uh, not well designed. That's one of the many problems uh, in the movie. And Melanie, you, you, you've also pointed out that it's a, um, not the strongest movie we've, we've ever looked at, unfortunately, because I really wanted it to be. Uh, but I'll end it here with this thought. In my opinion, The Lost Daughter is like a, a literary novel, literary quote unquote novel, that has beautiful line writing, but no substance, no actual story. It feels to me like it's trying really hard to be art, so hard that it forgot to actually tell us a story. Okay, Melanie, what do you have for today's action step? While it can be interesting for a viewer to puzzle about the protagonist's internal conflict, there should be a point in your story where the emotional or inner struggle becomes clear to the audience especially if the story uses a mini plot structure or what is commonly known as a character driven structure or a character driven story. Use the questions I've been using this season to make sure the story's internal conflict is clear. And if it's clear in your mind, it will become clear in your story and it will be easier to link to the external conflict as well. And that wraps it up for this week and for this season. That means that next week, Melanie and I will do a roundup of everything we've learned in the past 10 weeks about conflict and about cast design. To support the show, please leave us a rating and review and tell your writer friends about us. For access to writing templates and worksheets and more than 70 hours of training, subscribe to my inner circle by visiting valeriefrancis.ca slash inner circle and follow me on X, Instagram and threads at Valerie underscore Francis. And if you'd like to get Melanie's tips about books to help you read like a writer, visit Melanie on Facebook and Instagram under Melanie Hill author or find out more about her at melaniehill.com.au. And remember, story theory doesn't have to be difficult. It's a tool to help you write more, not less. So take it one step at a time and have fun. Mm -hmm.